And if you have your Bible, would you turn to the second book in the New Testament, the Gospel according to Mark. The Gospel according to Mark. And as you're turning there, let me say a couple of things. First of all, I want to ask our church to pray for uh, one of the members of our fellowship, Joel Penton. He's the founder and the CEO of LifeWise Academy. Uh, and the reason I ask you to do that particularly is Fox News Digital did an interview with Joel. And uh, it came up on the Fox app all over the country, all over the world. And uh, they are now, through LifeWise Academy, 325 plus schools across this country uh, will now have uh, release time Bible education. And I don't think for one second the devil likes that. And so I want to just ask you to just pray that God will put a hedge of protection around Joel, uh, his family, and LifeWise Academy. Secondly, uh, I'm looking forward to some city barbecue after the service today. And uh, don't start salivating because we'll probably get out around 2 o'clock today here. <laughs> I'm just teasing. It'll be 145. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you're our guest, there are notes in the bulletin that you received, and I would encourage you, everyone, to get those notes, get them out, and to fill in as we go along. I begin this message in your notes in that box. There are only two things that will last for eternity. Look up here, folks. Look up here. Get this picture in your mind. Everywhere you've been, everything you've done, everything you've seen, everything you've, you've bought, everything you possess now. But there are only two things that are going to last for eternity. The Word of God and the souls of men and women. The Word of God is forever fixed. It's settled, inerrant, infallible, and eternal. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but Jesus said, my words will by no means pass away. However, the eternal destiny of men and women hangs in the balance. That is why every day the heart of God is pleading with you and me, folks. Major on people. Major on people. Major on people. That shouldn't surprise us. If you've studied your Bible, because the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, God desires all, say the word all, all men to be saved. I didn't say that. God said that. The Bible says God desires, God says, I want you to understand, I desire that all men be saved. And what does that mean, be saved? You say, you and I were born into this world Physically different, different hospitals, different cities, but spiritually we were born identical. The Bible says we were born sinners by nature. And the only thing a person has to do in order to die and go to hell is do nothing. Sin demands a penalty and that penalty is death. However, my Bible tells me that God loves Every single person that's born. Spiritually, they're born a sinner by nature. That's why he sent Jesus, his son, into this world. That's why his son Jesus, at 33 years of age, went to the cross. That's why on the cross, God took your sin and my sin and placed them on his son. And the Bible says, he who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin. That sin, he, and he paid the penalty of our sin. He shed his blood because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And so God said, I want you to understand, I desire that all men, all women be saved. That shouldn't surprise us. Because 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all, say the word all, 
but that all should come to repentance. First John chapter two, verse two, Christ is the propitiation of, for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. I'm very thankful that early in my Christian life, I began to look at people as one or two, in one or two categories. In fact, I put them in your notes and I would encourage you to do this. Narrow your life down to two types of people. The first one, people for whom Jesus died. And the second is people in whom Jesus lives. We were all born in this world as people for whom Jesus died. But if a person comes and opens their heart and asks Jesus Christ to come into their life and to be their Savior in their Lord, the Bible says, for whoever for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't care who they are. I don't care how bad they are and how good they are. Nobody goes to heaven because they're good. All of our righteousness is in God's eyes like silk, filthy rags. For by grace, that means unmerited favor. That means you and I can't do anything. We, didn't do, we don't deserve it. For by grace are you saved through faith. But now watch this. It's not our faith that saves us. It's the object of our faith. I know this is weird, but if, what if I believe that this piece of furniture right here, if I put my faith in that, I'll go to heaven. Now you'd say, you're an idiot, Ken. And I would say, you're absolutely right. This is the object of my faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross. Uh, that, that cross that, that is up there, it's empty. We don't have a, an image of Jesus up there. Why? Because he came off of that cross. He was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead. That's the good news. That's the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. The Bible says, for by grace, unmerited favor, are you saved through faith. That none of yourselves, it's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. We're all born as people for whom Jesus died. Took me 26 years to come to that, to that notion that Jesus died for me. I knew me. I didn't deserve it. None of us did. One of the greatest preachers that ever lived, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, they used to literally on Saturday hand out tickets to get in to hear him preach on Sunday. Free. Thousands of people would listen to him every week. You know what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said? They called him the Prince of Preachers. I put this in your notes in that box. Spurgeon said, I would rather bring one soul to Jesus Christ than to unpick all the mysteries in the divine world. Now in a crowd this size, people listening elsewhere around this ministry center, watching online, there are some of you and your, your intentions are good, but you're spending your life in the good to the exclusion of the best. You're going to Bible study after Bible study after Bible study, and I, I wouldn't try to stop that whatsoever. But we go through all that kind of stuff and you give little attention to people around you that God's intersected your life with who are going to go to heaven or hell. There's a major hurdle that we have to get over. And I put that in your notes and here's the hurdle. It's what I call the seduction of the secondary the seduction of the secondary. We wind up spending, there, I, 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 would, I would venture to say that the majority of Christians, people who have legitimately asked Jesus Christ to be their personal savior, are spending their life doing the good to the exclusion of the best. Why do you think Jesus came into this world? 
so that people could be saved. It's not his will that, it's his will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In Mark chapter 12, in the first 12 verses there, we're going to be introduced to a man with a problem. We're going to see in this passage that there is a savior with the solution. But now watch this. We're going to be introduced to four friends who were willing to do whatever it takes to get this guy to Jesus. Look here. There are people in your network, people in your sphere of influence, people that God has intersected your life with, people in your neighborhood, people you work with. There are people all around you. And the question that I want to ask you, are you willing to be a part of whatever it takes to get that person to Jesus? Let's begin reading in verse number one, Mark chapter two. Again, he is speaking of Jesus. Again, Jesus entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why did this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately, he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Let's pray. Father, I do pray. And I ask you that the message would be crystal clear today, that I wouldn't fog it up, that those that are here, that know you as their personal Savior, would walk out of here today determined, committed, yielded to be an individual who says, whatever it takes, I want to get my friend to Jesus. And Lord, I pray for someone here today, for whoever is here, and they have never taken that step over the line of faith and put their complete faith and trust in you, Jesus. They've never opened their heart and asked you to come in and receive you as their personal savior. There's never been a time where they, they, they trusted you and nothing and no one else. Lord, I pray and I ask you that before this service is over, they would put their faith, their trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, amen. There are four categories of people that you see here. Let me give them to you quickly. First of all, there are they're the they're, they're people who are lost and without Christ. The paralytic really is a picture of every person who is lost without Christ, who in other words, left on their own, are incapable 
of coming to Jesus. I was thinking, as I was putting the message together, I was thinking about in the Old Testament book of Samuel, 2 Samuel, where there is a, a guy by the name of Mephibosheth. He was the son of Jonathan, who Jonathan was the son of King Saul. Jonathan and David, who ultimately David became king. I mean, they were genuine friendships. They were locked, man. They, they loved each other. Well, they were trying to kill, um, uh, the enemies were trying to kill um, uh, Jonathan and uh, his, uh, his armies. And Jonathan told uh, this nurse to take uh, Mephibosheth when he was just a young child and take him to safety. And so she was running for her life with Mephibosheth and something happened and the baby, the, the child fell and broke both of his feet, his legs. He was crippled for the remainder of his life. Fast forward years later, David is now king. Jonathan is dead. And, Je and, and David thought about Jonathan's family and Mephibosheth, a crippled. And there was no way in the world that Mephibosheth would ever be able to come on his own to meet the king, his father's best friend, and so David sent an entourage. He sent someone to go get Mephibosheth and they brought him and ultimately came and Mephibosheth, they sat him at the table to eat with King David. Folks, your life is filled with spiritual Mephibosheths, spiritual cripples who need the Lord, but will never come to know the Lord unless they're brought. Now I want you to keep in mind that this paralytic man, he was not only paralyzed by sickness, but if I could put it this way, he was polluted by sin. Just like you and I were when we were born. And the first thing Jesus says to this man in, in verse number five, he says, son, your sins are forgiven you. You see, this paralytic's main problem was not physical. You may be sitting here today and you may be thinking your biggest problem is financial or physical. You got a bad report or whatever it is. This paralytic's problem was not just physical. His main problem was spiritual. Now listen very carefully. I want to repeat this in different worlds. Your world, your world, my world, is filled with people who left to themselves will never come to Jesus. You ever give them pause? You ever give them pause to really legitimately think, meditate on this thought? When I got saved, I'm speaking for you. Have you ever thought that the moment you got saved, why didn't God take you to heaven? It's where you're going to wind up. You're never going to be able to worship God on this side like you're going to be able to worship him on that side. You know why he left you here? He left you here to be like one of those four guys that brought their friend to Jesus. Our main mission in life is not to get, not to acquire. All that stuff's fine. Nothing wrong with that. It's prudent to prepare. It's wonderful. Our main mission, however, regardless of what we do, where we live, who we are, our main mission is to be someone whose life is invested in trying to get people to Jesus. There's a second category of people that you see here, and these are people who I call people who are roadblocks. I mean, the very people, I don't know if you've ever thought about this in this passage, the very people who were listening to Jesus kept this man from coming to Christ. Verse two, immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. I mean, rather than be focused on souls, they're focused on themselves. There's a lot of people like that. I hope you're not one. 
rather than be being focused on souls, you're focused on yourself. A number of years ago, a couple from our fellowship was on vacation down in Myrtle Beach. And on a Sunday, they decided they're going to go to a church down there. And so they, they, uh, they found a church and uh, they, they wound up going. And it was like uh, ours. They, uh, uh, they had quickly investigated and found, oh, I think this is good. They came and they said they walked all the way down, sat on the second row right there. Right there, Shane, where you and Mallory are. Visitors sat right there. He said they were, they sat down and said about five minutes before the service, a couple comes down and looks at them and says, you're in our seats. True story. If I had been sitting there as a guest and someone who attended that church said to me, you're in my seats. You're in our seats. I would have gotten Debbie, took her by the hand and said, here we go, sweetie. And I'd have walked out of that church. I w- let's say I wasn't saved. I remember preaching years ago in Canton, Ohio, a very, very large ministry. I came to the time in the invitation, it was on a Sunday morning, and I asked every head to be bowed and every eyes to be closed. And about 25 and 30 people got up. And they just, all over the place, they just got up and left. Get, walked over people in the pew in order to get out. I asked the senior pastor afterwards. He said, yeah, he said, I've tried for years. He said, there are people, and I said, it was a huge ministry. He said, yeah, they're just trying to get out because, you know, there's a lot of cars just like here, and sometimes it takes a long time to get out. He said, but they want to get out and beat the traffic and get to the restaurant before the restaurant is filled. Caring more about getting out of the parking lot, getting to the restaurant than they are for the souls of somebody that may be sitting in that role that they just distracted as they were walking out, keeping someone from responding to the gospel. Let me just talk about the decorum that we ought to have here in our fellowship. Every time you come to church, you personally provide the atmosphere and the attitude that's most conducive for people being brought to Jesus. So that every time a lost person, every time a person that has not put their faith in Christ walks in the Northwest Bible, everything they see, everything they hear, everything they feel tells them, these people are really concerned about me. Every Sunday you come to church, Look for somebody, introduce yourself if you don't know them, engage in a conversation. There's a third category in this passage, and that are people, people who are critical, people who are critical. You see, instead of enjoying the miracle of salvation, there were some folks of the scribes and the Pharisees, they they were critical. Look at verse seven. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, the greatest obstacle of a person coming to Christ is not the atheist, it's not the agnostic, it's the cold, callous, critical person. You know what you'll see every time you walk into Northwest Bible? You'll see exactly what you're looking for. I would encourage you, in fact, I would challenge you to begin to pray today that every Sunday, Lord, pray this on Saturday, pray it on Sunday morning. Lord, help me to meet someone today that I don't know so that I might purposely encourage and brighten their day. But there's a fourth category that you see here and that are people who care. 
I want to promise you something, folks. This man, this paralytic, never forgot who those four men were. My father drilled into me that old saying, son, people don't care about how much you know. They want to know how much you care. Over 45 years ago, after Deb and I were, were married and I was a singles pastor in Kansas City, a young adult came into our singles ministry, young guy, disillusioned, very bright guy. Spiritually, if I could say it, just out to lunch. He sent me an email. I want to read just a portion of the email. Hi, Ken. I hope you're having a great year. We bought a house last year, and my wife and I were cleaning out some boxes, and I found a CD with some old pictures on it. And you can tell it was years ago with a CD with pictures on it. Thought you might like this one. I was tempted to show you the picture, but I thought, better not. Better not. I've had better days looking in any way. And then he ended by saying, thanks again for your ministry in my early life. It took a long time to sink in, but you've had a great influence on my walk with the Lord. Why? He walked in, a couple hundred young adults in our Sunday school class. I looked at him. I engaged with him. I went out with him, talked with him, just a spiritually disillusioned guy who came to Christ and ultimately it sunk in. Let me just pause right here and ask you which category are you in? Are you lost and without Christ? In other words, let me put it this way. If you knew that by midnight tonight, you were going to draw your last breath and die. Are you going to heaven or to hell? Are you absolutely confident that when you draw your last breath, you know you're going to heaven? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You don't go to heaven any other way except through Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Are you lost without Christ? If you are, listen carefully. At the conclusion of my message, I'm going to give you an opportunity to settle your eternal destiny once and forever. Once and for all. What category are you in? Is your life a roadblock? Spiritually, you're lackadaisical. You, when it comes to other people, really a lack of interest, no enthusiasm. Oh, you may, you may be engaged with them, but spiritually speaking, you don't really, you're not doing anything to try to get them to Jesus. You're a roadblock. Are you a person who's critical? Or are you a person who cares? People don't care about how much you know. They want to know how much you care. I'm telling you what. You genuinely care for someone. You've earned the right to speak into their life. They'll listen to you because you care. Are you an individual that says, come hell or high water, whatever it takes, I want to get my friend to Jesus. I want to get that person that I work with, that person that I live by. I want to get that, I want to see this couple that our kids play sports together. I want to see them come to know Jesus. If you want to be someone who says, whatever it takes, 
let me give you five things to ask God for. And by the way, you don't have these on your own. I didn't have these on my own. You don't have them on your own. You got to ask God for them. And God knows whether we're sincere or not, okay? Here's the first thing you got to ask God for. Number one, ask him for a heart for the lost. Somewhere, folks, I do know this, that these four men got to thinking about someone other than themselves. You know, if we take a good, honest inventory, how much time do we spend just thinking about ourselves? You know, you know what the key to this is? The key to having a heart for the lost? I put it in your notes. The key is the word compassion. It means to put yourself in the place of the other person. Compassion. You can be tough, you can be hard, you can be, you can be focused, but you can have compassion. Compassion, folks, is not a, it's not, it's not an element of weakness. To me, it's an element of strength. It's an element, I care about you. But that compassion isn't something that we're just, we're just born with. God, give me a heart for people, a heart for the lost, a man that had leprosy came to Jesus one day and he fell down and he was kneeling and he said to the Lord, he said, if you're, if you're willing, if you're willing, Jesus, you can make me clean. And the Bible tells us in Mark chapter one and verse 41, then Jesus, watch this, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing be cleansed. Jesus one day went to the city of Nain, and when he got to the gate to the city, there was a little funeral entourage that was coming out, and there was a son of a lady who herself was a widow. Her only child had died, and they were carrying him out. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 7 and verse 13, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, do not weep. And the Lord took that body, spoke, and that guy came back, son came back to life. One day, a man was going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, and they beat him, and they robbed him, and they, I mean, they messed him up, and he was lying there. The Bible says half dead. And along came a priest and the priest saw him, and the priest went around and went on the other side. Then a Levite came, and he saw him and said, oh, good, went around the other side. And then another guy came, and the Bible tells us in Luke 10 for 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And the Bible tells me that that Samaritan who was considered by people like a, like a half-breed. Samaritans were, for the most part, considered despicable. You know what he did? He, he put on his wounds, he bandaged him up, put him on his animal. And he walked the guy into the city, put him in a hotel and asked the guy that owned, that ran the hotel, gave him two denarii, two days wages. And he said, take care of him. And if you spend any more money than that, when I come back by, I'll pay you the difference. He had compassion. There was a son. One day he got tired of living in his family went to his father and said, give me my inheritance. I want to get out of here and eat, drink, and be happy. His father gave him his inheritance, and he went out, and he lived like there was no tomorrow. Spent all of his money, had all the women, had all the friends, as long as he had money. And when he had spent it all, he wound up with nothing. 
no money to even buy food, wound up sleeping with the hogs, finally came to his senses. And the Bible says that he came and the Bible says in Luke 15, 20, he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, watch this. And his father had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. But you know, these four guys that brought the paralytic to Jesus, these four men had their eyes on one man. And that's the secret of being, <clears throat> excuse me, bringing people to Jesus. Ask God for a heart for the lost. Be honest with God and say, God, I, I don't know the last time I had compassion on anyone. But I want to see this world as though I was looking through your eyes. I'm a person whom you live within, but there are many people in my network who are people that you died for, you don't live in. And God, I want a heart for the lost. I want to be what, I want to say whatever it takes. Second thing to ask God for is number two, ask him for a love that finds a way. A love that finds a way. Look at verse four. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, <laughs> they just broke through that roof. They let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Let me just tell you, if you're, if you're going to be used of God, you come to a barrier, you just start using creativity. When you come to, a, to an obstacle, you begin to look at them differently. You look at them as opportunities. These men used every means at their disposable. You know why? Because love will find a way. They were determined they were going to get that guy to Jesus. Right now. Right now today. Maybe it's time that you began to look at your home a little different. Look at your home as a place where God could use, that God can use in an incredible way to reach your friends. Take him out to lunch, take him to dinner, build bridges. Invite them to church. If you go to the same grocery store, go to the same grocery line every week or wherever that individual is that's checking out the food. Build a bridge with that individual. If you were here last week, you saw on the platform a guy that, um, Corey DeCaro, that, He's good looking, isn't he? Just leave that up there. Corey DeCarl, well, about 15 years ago, was not on our, our church staff. And he was working uh, in field technology and all that and had a nice job. And on his desk... I don't know if he was a project manager or whatever it was, but on his desk, he had a Bible. He didn't preach to fellow employees. He just had a Bible there that he would read and kept it right on there. There was a guy that worked there that uh, became good friends with uh, Corey. Noticed the Bible. This guy uh, didn't know anything about the Bible. He uh, had grown up um, went to church, they were Catholic, went to church on Sunday and that was it. They did their hour and that was it. Never read the Bible, didn't. I don't even know if he even had a Bible, but Corey did. And one day Corey invited this guy to come to, uh, to his home, uh, his apartment, uh, and his girlfriend, um, Corey's girlfriend was going to be there. And I, I don't know if somebody else was going to be there. They were going to have a Bible study. <laughs> and this guy said, hey, no way I'm coming to a Bible study. But Corey would invite him every so often. And one day this guy said to Corey, don't stop inviting me. 
I just might come. And sure enough, one week he went to that Bible study. He said, but if I come, you got to promise me, you're not going to ask me any questions because I don't know anything about this stuff. But you see, Corey cared for this guy. And the guy finally came to the Bible study. The guy began to hear the truth that God loved him. Sent Jesus to die for him. And that if he would open his heart and ask Jesus Christ, he could know that he was on his way to heaven. And one night, he put, I don't know if it was there or afterwards, that he, he prayed and he just gave his life to Jesus. Came the next Sunday to our church. I gave the invitation. He raised his hand. I've accepted Christ as my personal Savior. Came out to where I was. I asked him and others that raised their hand, meet me in the foyer. And he came to me in the foyer. And if you come to my office after the service, you'll see his picture. His name is Bob Hart. He's my son-in-law. He's the husband of my daughter. He's the father of three of my grandsons. And he's going to heaven because there was a guy that he worked with that thought whatever it takes. I'm not going to preach him into heaven. I'm going to build a friendship because why? I care for him. And he had compassion on Bob. You see, love will find a way. Ask God for God, give me a love for people that I don't have. Third thing to ask God for is ask him for a band of others. A band of others. Not a band of brothers, because that would leave all the ladies out. Ask him for a, ask him, I, I am, I am, I'm serious. Ask him for a band of others. Verse number three says, then they came to Jesus bringing, these four guys bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but one man couldn't have done it alone. In the Civil War, Soldiers were told when they walked across a bridge, they were told not to walk in cadence because if they walked in cadence and all of their weight at one time came down, it would collapse the bridge. I put in your notes in that box. Imagine the powerful force of a few people truly banded together with the single person of getting a person to Jesus how about this? When you golf, golf with a foursome. But make sure that one of them, and don't just do it one time. Have somebody in that foursome that doesn't know Jesus as your Savior and band together with the other two and the three of you band together as a band of others wanting to get that guy, that gal to Jesus. Ladies, if you go out to lunch, you meet someone in the park while the kids are playing, do that. Get two or three of you together and someone that you know that your paths cross so often. Maybe your kids go to school together. I don't know. But wanting to get, when you go out to eat, you ever thought of going out to eat and having a few couples but making sure one of them doesn't know the Lord, and you build a relationship of friendship, but you got a purpose in mind. You care for them, and you want to see them get to Jesus. Jesus said, what does it profit a man or a woman if they gain the whole world and lose their own soul? I remember many, many years ago reading and studying the Canadian geese. They fly in a V formation. The goose that's out in the lead, you'll see him. He'll go for so long. He'll go for so long and then they'll leave and they'll fade back and somebody will take his place. 
there were some specialists in the field of aerodynamics that calibrated in a wind tunnel what happens in that V formation. Because they found that in that V formation that a goose, when a goose will flap its wings, it will create an inward and an upward draft for the goose that is behind them. And they discovered that if all of the geese will do their part and fly in formation, they are able to go 71% farther than if one goose went by themselves. Let me go back to Corey and Bob for a moment. Put Corey and Bob's pictures up there. There are two guys now that are on their way to heaven, attending Northwest, working in the same place. You know what they did? They came, became a band of two brothers because there was somebody else that worked with them. Their friend, they would eat together. They would socialize at times together. But this guy was just like Bob used to be. Didn't know Jesus as their savior. But Corey and Bob banded together. They wanted to get this guy to Jesus. And finally, they got him to start coming to Northwest Bible. I remember him sit, sitting down front. And one weekend, he was under such conviction that he told Bob and Corey, I'm not coming to church this weekend. And he went away by himself for the weekend. And while he was there away on the weekend, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. His name is John Herman, and if you look on our web page and go to where it says the Board of Directors and Deacons, he is now a deacon at Northwest Bible. And it all started when one guy cared about another guy and wanted to get him to Jesus. And then those two guys banded together because they wanted to get John to Jesus. Ask God for a band of others. Fourth thing to ask God for is ask him for confidence. Ask him for confidence. The Bible tells me and tells you in Psalm 126.6, he that goeth forth and weepeth. Let me just pause right there. I'm not a crier. I just don't cry a lot. And I remember looking at that and I'm going, does that mean I've got to cry every time? You know what it is? You can have tears. And there have been moments and times in my Christian life when I wept over somebody that was not a believer that I wanted to see get to Jesus. But I found out that you don't have to shed a tear if your heart gets broken for them. Broken. But we get so consumed with ourself, our life, our schedule, our finances, our everything, that we're so cluttered with stuff like that that we don't allow God to just drill through all that and begin to give us the compassion and a heart that begins to bleed where you wake up in the middle of the night and you think about the person and you just say, God, please, let me get that person to you. I want to see that person saved. I want to see them be able to know that they're on their way to heaven. Psalm 126, 6, he that goeth forth and weeping, bearing precious seeds shall doubtless, say the word doubtless, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing the sheaves with him. You know, faith is not belief. You know what faith is? Faith is belief with legs on it. 
The Bible says they brought him to Jesus. These four guys could have said, oh, I believe that this guy, I believe if he, got him, I believe if he gets to Jesus, he could be saved. But they never do a thing about it. That's not faith. James chapter 2, verse 18 says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my Ask God for confidence. God, I believe, give me the confidence that if I get someone to you, they'll get saved. You know, I got to be honest with you. Whenever I preach and I give an invitation, I am shocked if nobody gets saved. If I talk to somebody and build a relationship with them, I just absolutely believe that sooner or later they're going to be saved. There's one more thing, and that is ask God for a selfless spirit. And by that I mean showing a great concern for others and little or no concern for yourself. You know, these four guys, they didn't care if they were criticized. They didn't care if they were ostracized. They didn't care what the cost was. They didn't care if they would be laughed at. They tore the roof off to get this guy to Jesus. If I could use that phrase, and let me ask you, are you willing to tear the roof off to get someone to Jesus? Are you like those four men this morning? Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, Lord, I want to get them to you. Then you know what you need to do? You need to just pray, oh God, don't ever let me lose that. Are you a roadblock? Are you somewhat critical? And what you need to do is you need to say, God, change my heart. I don't want to be a roadblock for anybody. I want to be a conduit. Give me that heart that says whatever it takes. Or are you someone who is lost and without Christ? Nobody goes to heaven because they say a few words. Somebody goes to heaven when they realize they are a sinner and they need a savior. If I am drowning in Lake Erie and I don't know how to swim, I don't need someone to come along and throw me a book, 99 Steps to Quick Swimming. I don't need someone to come alongside as an encourager and says, come on, you can do it, you can, no. You know what I need? I need someone to come along and throw me a lifeline that I can grab onto that has saved my life. What I offer you today is an opportunity to walk out of here knowing you're on your way to heaven, but it's only through Jesus Christ. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Every head bowed, please, every eye closed. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you know Jesus as your Savior, I can tell you where he wants you to be. He wants you to be someone. He wants us to be a fellowship that says whatever it takes. I want to get people to Jesus. If God can use Corey, and God can use Bob, and God can use John, and you know what? God can use Ken, and God can use you. But if you're here today, and you say, Ken, the truth is, if I were to die today, I don't think I'd go to heaven, but I want to go. Then here's what I want to do. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, 
I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. But now listen, forget I'm here, forget anyone here. This is between God and you. But if you will pray this and you will mean it, on the authority of God's word, he'll hear your prayer. He'll forgive you of your sins. You'll walk out of here today on your way to heaven. Let me lead you. I'll pray out loud so you can hear you pray just between God and you. Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner and I know that I need a savior. I open my heart to your son, Jesus. I do that right now. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I receive you this very moment as my Savior and my Lord. I am trusting nothing and no one but you for the forgiveness of my sin. Thank you, God, for hearing my prayer and forgiving me of my sin. Thank you for bringing me into your forever family. While our heads are still bowed and eyes are closed, please, no one looking. If just then you prayed and you meant it, would you do me a favor? With no one looking but me, would you just slip your hand up in a moment and by doing, you're saying, Ken, I prayed and I meant it. I asked Jesus to come into my life. Just slip it up right now. Just take it up. God bless you, sir. Someone else, God bless you, sir. Someone else, I prayed, I asked Christ to come into my life. Thank you, you may take it down. I'm going to be in the foyer after this service. For those of you that prayed and asked Christ to come into your life, that lifted your hand, maybe you didn't lift your hand, but you really meant it, you prayed. I want to ask you to come to me and just say, just say, just say, Ken, I prayed that prayer. I want to say something to you before you leave today. Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you what you can do with people who just genuinely care about the eternal destiny of other people. And I ask that you would make us a fellowship, God, like never before a fellowship of people who care for people, and we want to see them come into an eternal relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.